I'm Nate, not Matt. Pastor Matt was last week, but you'll see we all, we all kind of know each other. It's a small world. I used to serve with Pastor Dave at uh, JCA for many years, if you didn't know. Uh, I was actually here about a month ago, and uh, I preached on the first sermon on the series on Esther, and I said, if you invite me back, I'll go on to the second one. So today we're going to continue on that series, the second one. This may be the longest series that has ever been preached, but uh, we're going to continue on the second uh, sermon of Esther, and it is, again, uh, titled God at Work, because God is always at work. It's all about the fact that God is always at work. That's what Esther is about, the book of Esther. And, and that's great news, because that means that God never sleeps, he never forgets, and he never makes a mistake. And today we're going to see how God fulfills his plan through imperfect people. Uh, I chuckled so hard this past week as I was preparing this message because uh, I remembered back to a time. <laughs> so that, that's Pastor Matt. That's, that's Pastor Dave and Pi, and then that's me right there. Um, so Pastor Dave and Pi, they look exactly the same. Pastor Matt looks mostly the same. Uh, <laughs> but me, um, you know, I, I met uh, Mrs. Chuang Pai's mom earlier before we started church, and she was just like, wow, you look much younger. And um, yeah. I guess because I, I, I lost some weight and hairstyle change, put some glasses on and uh, dressed differently. <laughs> but to give you an example of uh, what I'm trying to get at, when I first started serving at JCA as a pastor, nobody, nobody thought I was a pastor. I mean, I was at a, a, a young adult ultimate Frisbee game and people thought I was invited so like they could minister to me as, as a non-believer. Uh, <laughs> others thought that I was a, a hired security guard for the church. Uh, I was just like, okay. And then some others thought that I was the hired bus driver because uh, I used to drive the, the, the van for some of the college students. So, and that's because, as you can see over here, if you saw me, and maybe still today, I, I don't really look like a pastor. And even at that time, I didn't really feel like a pastor. I didn't feel like I was worthy of being a pastor. And so uh, most people don't know this because I've never really openly talked about this, but at least Pastor Matt doesn't know about this. Uh, when he asked me to serve uh, at JCA, I, I was just like, no. And I, I just felt unworthy. I felt unqualified. Like there was no way that a punk like me could serve at a church where, you know, for me, it was like a group of some of the nicest and, and goodest kids that I'd ever seen in my life. And so there was no way that I would be used to, to serve as a pastor. And so I said no, but God kept tugging at my heart and he invited me to participate and to serve as a pastor at JCA. I did that for five years. To this day, I feel unworthy uh, to be a pastor. At the same time, I think uh, it's been a privilege and it has been an honor to participate in God's plan of salvation. And so today we're going to see that God's always at work. I mean, regardless of the good or bad decisions we make in life, whether we're living with good motives or bad, God is working. God is always working through our most imperfect decisions to fulfill his promises. And let's, so let's see what God has to say through his word. I mean, today we're going to read from Esther chapter 2, 1 through 18. It's a long passage, bear with me, but um, it's good stuff. So Esther chapter 2, uh, after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done. What she had done was she refused to come and, you know, hang out in front of the king and display herself because the king's servants, the king's friends were all drunk and she just didn't want to embarrass herself. So she doesn't come and uh, she was banished from the kingdom. And so what happened, what had been, so she was, she was not, what had been decreed against her was she was not allowed to come to see the king again. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, let their cosmetics be given them. And then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So this pleased the king, this whole idea pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. 
He was bringing up Hadessa, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young woman to the best place in the harem. Esther had not been made known, had not made, not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the ki- turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashkaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go in to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, had, who had charge of the woman, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her, and when Esther had taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. So my focus and prayer for us today is that we'll see that God fulfills his plans regardless of our sin. And therefore, may we seek to participate in God's plan. There's uh, three points I have for us today, that God uses imperfect people to fulfill his plan, that God can use anyone to fulfill his plan, and lastly, God does the work to fulfill his plan. So the first one is that God uses imperfect people to fulfill his plan. God doesn't need us to be perfect. He doesn't need us to perfectly obey his laws, and he doesn't need us to make perfect decisions every single time. He just wants us to participate in his plan. Like I said earlier, if you knew me before I became a pastor, and this is a picture of me before I became a pastor, you couldn't imagine me as a pastor. Actually, I never thought that God could use someone like me or call someone like me to do his work. My father, who's next to me there, he is a pastor. Um, He met Jesus when he was in high school. And after that, he decided he was going to go to college and make something of himself. And he served as the first uh, president for the Youth for Christ in Korea. After that, he, uh, went to, he came to the States and he got his Master's of Divinity here. And then after that, he went to Stellenbosch, South Africa, and he got his uh, master's, uh, master's of Theology and then his PhD, technically THD, uh, Doctorate of Theology. And he's become a, he served as a, uh, an influential New Testament professor at a seminary, and then he just retired recently. My point is that he was, and he still is, a faithful Christian. Now, my story is not the same. Like, I I met Jesus in high school as well, but I had to meet Jesus over and over and over again before I started actually changing the way that I lived. The first time I remember was in high school, but it was like this okay, I understand who this Jesus is, but it didn't change the way that I lived. It didn't change um, how, how that affected me. And then I joined the military after high school. I served for six years. And during those six years, I moved around a lot. But also, because I worked on weekends, I had a lot of excuses to not go to church that often. And so for six years, I was more like a two times a year kind of Christian. I would just go to church on Easter and Christmas. That was my life. And um, But while I was in the military, God called me to serve as a pastor. And it was very clear, unmistakable. And even then, it took me years to start to change, to become getting right with God. In other words, I didn't change immediately. And I wish I had done things differently, but I didn't. 
And that's part of the reason why I couldn't imagine myself as a pastor. I mean, people will surely find out that this guy calls himself a pastor, he's studying to become a pastor, and he's such a hypocrite. I mean, he doesn't even do his devotions every day. He doesn't even read the Bible every day. He doesn't pray for hours on every day. He's not a holy person. Surely I'd be found out. I would be found out. I mean, most times, I mean, I try to do my best. At least that's what I tell myself. And it's still not that great. And sometimes, if I'm really honest, I'm not even, I don't even try that hard. But God called me to be his work, to do his work. I am unfaithful. I am unfaithful, and yet God is faithful. I'm not even close to being perfect, and yet God chooses to use me. In today's text, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see that Esther wasn't perfect either. Mordecai was not perfect. But God chose to use them because the fact is, the truth is, that God doesn't need perfect people to fulfill his plan. Let me show you where I see this. In the beginning of chapter 2, We see in verse 1, after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So there's a sense of regret here. King Ahasuerus, um, he regrets banning Queen Vashti from his presence. He realizes, oh man, I made a stupid decision when I was drunk and, uh, and and it was probably because she was so beautiful and he, he misses, uh, hanging out with her. (laughs) So in verse two, the king's young men who see this and they're like, okay, okay, we get it. They attended to him and said, let a a whole bunch of beautiful young virgins from this province, from this this nation uh, be sought out for the king. So this is chapter two and it's explaining how Esther becomes a new queen, but not in a God honoring way like Daniel. In preaching, the context is very important. If you were here last time, I, 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 share, I shared that I, I'm doing a PhD in preaching, so this is what I think about all the time. And well, context is very important because it's the context of the text that explains the authorial intent. Like what was this author who was writing this book? What was he or she trying to convey? What was the author of Esther trying to convey? And so it's important to note that in verses five through, five through seven, the author highlights that Esther and Mordecai are Jews. And so that means that this story is completely rooted in Jewish culture. And so we need to go back and we need to go into the details of this historical background to better understand what's going on here. In short, Esther and Mordecai, they are being unfaithful to the Torah. The Torah is is the book of the law. The Torah is in our Old Testament. And the Torah is, uh, is basically telling the Israelites how to live according to God's ways. And here... The fact that Esther and Mordecai are not living according to the Torah is a really bad thing. Now remember, the king is a Gentile. He's not a Jew. And according to the Torah, a Jew is not allowed to marry someone who is not a Jew. You are not to marry somebody who is a Gentile, which means not a Jew. And it's not a suggestion. It's a commandment that the Lord gives. God does not want these Jews to intermarry with people that are not Jews. And it's kind of a big deal. And that's why if you read in the Bible, you'll see that there's there's a, uh, a war going on between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans are these Jews, half Jews. They are Gentiles who married with the Jews. So they're half Jews, half Gentile. And the Jews just absolutely have a big problem with that. And now Esther is about to do the same thing. She's in line to marry a Gentile king. Now, additionally, in order to be queen, the author writes in verses 8 through 9 that Esther had to go through beauty treatments. And this means that she likely broke the food laws and the Sabbath laws. In verse 12, the author tells us that the treatments lasted a year, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments. I mean, they went through this entire yearly, year-long treatment because she needed to be the best Esther, best version of Esther to please the king. And so... What happens is part of that beauty treatment for a year includes a special diet. It includes what you eat because you couldn't be too fat or you couldn't be too skinny to be in front of the king. And so there are laws about, and and so, but in the Torah, there are laws about this food that you can eat. There are special laws dictating what you can eat and what you cannot eat. And then there are laws about keeping the Sabbath. You can work up to six days a week. Fine. Fine. But on the seventh day, one day a week, you cannot work. You have to rest. 
Now, it doesn't say that Esther explicitly violated these laws. It's not like the author was like, Esther violated these and so now she's a sinner. It doesn't say that. But because we see that she hid her identity as a Jew in verse 10, the author implies that she went along with the customs of the Persian people. Like she did what the Persians did. In other words, it's most likely that Esther violated the laws of the Torah. Lastly, at the end of the beauty treatment, we see in verses 12 through 14 that Esther had to have a one-night stand with the king. Well, unless that is if the king wanted to see her again. As if intermarrying with a Gentile, breaking food laws, and disobeying the Sabbath. If, as if that wasn't bad enough, now Esther is going to have premarital sex. And I mean, all Christians know that this is sleeping with someone before they get married. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. And well, that's the point. The author is trying to tell us that we need to question Esther and Mordecai's choices. And by doing so, the author is trying to tell us that these are not perfect people. These are flawed people. Now, this is such a big deal that 15th century Jewish commentator Abraham Sabah writes this. Now, this is a little bit on the extreme side, but this is what he writes. Now, when Mordecai heard the king's herald announcing that whoever had a daughter or a sister should bring her to the king to have intercourse with an uncircumcised heathen, why did he not risk his life to take her to some deserted place to hide until the danger would pass? He should have been killed rather than to submit such, to such an act. Why did Mordecai not keep righteous Esther from idol worship? Why was he not more careful? Where was his righteousness, his piety, and his valor? She, as in Esther, too, should by right have tried to commit suicide before allowing herself to have intercourse with him, as in King Asherosh. This commentator is saying that Mordecai should have killed himself trying to protect Esther and Esther should have tried, tried to kill her. So she should have killed herself instead of going along with this plan. That's how wrong it was. And I think it's clear that everyone, not everyone thinks that Esther and Mordecai did the right thing. I mean, this is not acceptable behavior. And I think some Christians today might feel the same way because most of us are thinking about another character in the Bible called Daniel. He was in a very similar situation as Esther. He was also exiled. And he was in a foreign empire with foreign dietary laws and just things that are against the Torah. And yet he obeyed those dietary laws. He refused to eat what the king served. He would not disobey God's law to conform to the world. He refused to eat what the king served. And as far as we know, he prayed many times a day. He obeyed the Sabbath. He lived according to the Torah and the interesting thing is that God took care of him. I mean, most of us know the story. He was thrown into a den of lions because he disobeyed the king's laws. He was thrown into a den of lions, and yet God saved him. He shut the mouths of those lions, so the next day when the king comes to check up on Daniel, he hasn't been touched. Those lions are sleeping on his lap. And eventually God uses Daniel as the second most powerful man right under the king of one of the greatest empires in ancient history. So there's a, a clear difference between how Daniel obeyed and how Esther, I guess, disobeyed. And yet God choose, chooses to use Esther. I think most of us would like to be a Daniel. Unfortunately, if I'm really honest, I feel more like an Esther. I don't, I don't feel like a Daniel. I don't feel like a holy man. I don't stand out to this world. I look just like a regular person, like a non-believer. I, I, I don't feel different like Daniel is. And I think that's the great news about this chapter. I think that's the great news about the Esther story. Since God used someone like Esther, like Mordecai, who are imperfect, God can use someone like me. God doesn't need us to be perfect. He doesn't need us to perfectly obey his laws and he doesn't need us to perfectly make perfect decisions every single time. He just wants us to participate in his plan. And that's because God can use anyone or even anything to make, to fulfill his plan. That's my second point. God can use anyone to fulfill his plan. God doesn't need perfect people to do his work. He doesn't even really need people to do his work. That means he wants us to participate. So I, 
I grew up in the church, and that means I heard all these stories growing up. I heard stories of Abraham and Moses and David. Uh, you know, growing up, I thought these stories were there to like teach us, like we're supposed to be like them. So there's, you know, Abraham is the father of faith. Have faith like Abraham. Or there's Moses, and Moses obeyed God, so it's like, obey like Moses. And then, and then we learn about David, he's this man after God's own heart, and so, so we should seek God like David. And, uh, and I'm not saying that these things aren't true, but I'm learning that none of these people were perfect. I mean, Abraham's faith wasn't perfect. If we think about it, and we, and we read into his life that God told him that he's going to have a son, Abraham, God tells Abraham, you're going to have uh, a descendants like the stars of the sky. And Abraham is like 80 years old and he doesn't have a kid yet. And God says, oh, you're going to have all these descendants. And so after he waited 14 years, he decides, okay, maybe, maybe I need to sleep with my servant Hagar so we can have a child. And that's maybe how, what God meant. And so they have Ishmael, but then God's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not what I meant. So maybe Abraham's faith wasn't so good after all. And then Moses, you know, God calls Moses and he says, hey, I need you to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, why me? I can't even speak well. I I have a speech impediment. I I stutter. Like, I, I can't, I can't talk properly. Why are you calling me to do it? Use someone else. And so after arguing with God, finally he uses Aaron, but maybe I guess Moses' obedience wasn't that great either. And then David, well, we all know he didn't, exactly always seek God's heart. I mean, he committed adultery. He sees some beautiful woman showering in the river and and he lusts after her and he he basically forces himself upon her. And then to cover it up, he has her husband killed. He murders her husband. I mean, that's not a good example of a man after God's heart. But maybe that was never the point of these stories. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's actually great news for me because when I looked like, when I looked to these people to become like these people, I realized how impossible that was. I can't have this faith like Abraham. I can't obey like Moses. And I doubt I want to know God's heart like David did. I'm just not sure I would do that. But that's not the point of these stories. I think these stories are pointing to a main character. The main character of the story is God. And God is This perfect God who's choosing to use imperfect people. I think this is what the Esther story is all about. The Esther story is about a perfect God who chooses to use imperfect people. The author doesn't give us too many details about Esther. But in verses 5 through 7, the author writes that Esther is a Jew. That she is raised by her cousin Mordecai because her father and mother died. And presumably that means that her parents died because uh, when she was young, and that's why she needed to be raised by her cousin, who's probably a bit older. And together, they're part of a, a group of Jews that have been kicked out of their country, exiled out of their country, captured and taken to Susa of Babylon. Again, this is modern-day Iran. And so the author is highlighting that Esther was beautiful, but what's especially noteworthy is that Esther is an orphan. The author tells us in verses 2 and 8 that many beautiful young virgin women were gathered to please the king and be the next queen. But as some commentators will say, not only does the gathering of all the young beautiful virgins from throughout the empire seem outrageously unliking to our modern thinking, even by Persian standards, even by those cultural standards back then, this was not the way a queen was normally chosen. According to Herodotus, which is a, a Jewish historian, so King Ahasuerus' father, uh, Darius, he took his wives from noble, the noble families of Persia. So often they came from the families of the king's seven closest advisors that we saw in chapter 1. So Karshena, Shethar, Admathar, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, Mamukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media. So some think that perhaps one of Mamukan's ulterior motives, so Mamukan was the one who suggested to the king, okay, we're going to just make sure that Queen Vashti never gets to see you ever again. So, one, so people think that one of Mamukan's ul- ulterior motives to having Queen Vashti banished from the king's presence is that he was hoping that maybe the next queen would come from his family, and so that would increase his influence with the king. So it would give him more power. But again, the author tells us that Esther was an orphan. 
I mean, she didn't have rich or powerful parents. In fact, she had no parents. And if you look throughout the Bible, God tells Christians to specifically look after orphans and widows. And that's because in Scripture, orphans, they symbolize the epitome of loss, defenselessness, and the unraveling of society. Because their great need demands advocacy. They are separated from their father, their source of provision and protection. And so God himself protects them. In other words, Esther is not the kind of person that anybody expected that God would use. But it's clear that God chose to use Esther, an orphan. And we saw this in the first point. Esther's not perfect. And that's because God can use anyone. Now, just because God can use anyone doesn't mean God should use anyone but me. That's not a license to say that, you know, God can just use anybody else but me. We shouldn't be thinking that God should use somebody else because you can use somebody else. It's not saying we should be asking God, please use somebody else because you can use anyone. That's not the point of this. It means that if God can use flawed people like me, no, if he can use flawed people like Abraham, like Moses, David, and Esther, that means he can use me. It means he can use you. Can I just ask you, do you ever feel like you've done mm, or haven't done something that disqualifies you from serving God? I mean, do you ever feel like you're too sinful to be used by God? Unqualified? Do you ever feel like maybe your faith is too weak to be used by God? This is a message designed to encourage us. It's a message of hope. It's a message of grace. Despite our imperfections, God chooses to use us. Remember, God can use anything, not just anyone, but anything to fulfill his plan. I mean, there's a story of God using a donkey to talk to fulfill his plan. Many times, if we read throughout the Bible, God uses his angels to fulfill his work. And it seems like God's always trying to convince people that doing my work, participating in my plan is the best thing that can ever happen to you. That's the best thing you can do in this world. This is God's grace. I mean, he could just be like, fine, you don't want to do it? I use someone else. He could just turn his back on us. And yet he chooses to invite us. He lets us participate in his work. Even though we're sinners, even though we're imperfect, God chooses to use us. And that's the message of hope. Remember, God doesn't need perfect people to do his work. He doesn't even need people to do his work. That means he wants us to participate. God wants us to participate. But don't forget that God's still the one who's doing the work. Because God is the one who does the work to fulfill his plan. Our motives for what we do will always be corrupted by sin. And sometimes we don't even do the right thing. But most times we do the right thing with mixed motives. Either way, God still works. When it comes to Bible stories, as mentioned earlier, usually there's like a lesson to be learned. That's why we teach in Sunday school. Most of the time there's an aspect of a character we're supposed to copy. Like I mentioned, you know, we're supposed to do what, what they did. So like have faith like Abraham, have faith like Abraham, you know, like obey like Moses, do that, you know, love God like David, okay, do that. But sometimes that's just not the case. And Esther is an example that's not supposed to be that kind of case. Esther is not supposed to be an example for moral behavior. First of all, notice that the author doesn't say any good or bad things about her behavior. There are no judgments made on her actions. Just that's what happened. The author could have written reasons why Esther had no choice in the matter, like, you know, she was helpless or she was being wise and she was being rude. That's how, that's, that's, she had no choice. This is wise. Like, there's no explanation though. The author just writes, this is what happened. Moreover, Esther cannot be an example for moral behavior because how would you do that? I mean, think about it. How would you use this episode from Esther's life to teach your daughter. This is not a good example for someone's daughter as they're about to enter adulthood. What message would she get? Make yourself as attractive as possible to powerful men? 
That's ridiculous. Use your body to advance the kingdom of God. Absolutely not. The ends justify the means? No. The exemplary approach does not work here because that's not the author's intent. That's not what the author is trying to do. The author doesn't want us to copy Esther's behavior. The author just wrote the facts of what happened to show that God was at work behind the scenes. So there's no arguing against the fact that Esther made a lot of questionable decisions. I mean, she most likely broke the food laws. She blended into the culture and standing out. She most likely broke the Sabbath law. She slept with someone before they got married. She ends up marrying a Gentile, and there's no saying what her motives were. We can make educated guesses as to why she did that, but, you know, it'd just be guesses. We have no idea. We can't be sure why she went along with this crazy plan. And yet this was all a part of God's plan. If we look at verses 8 and 9, we read, Many young women were gathered in Susa of the city dale in custody of Haggai, the, who, who had charge of the women, and the young woman, Esther, pleased him and won his favor. So here we see that Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. One could argue that Esther was acting wisely, but I would argue that it was actually God working because God is always working. And let me show you. Verse 15, we read, Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And then in verse 17, we read, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. First, noteworthy is the fact that she found favor in, from some very important people. Isn't that interesting? She somehow found favor from the right people. From the right people. I don't think that was a coincidence, and I don't think there was anything special that Esther really did to kind of like stand out. Like she wasn't like a brown noser. She wasn't trying to, you know, make herself to earn anything. Like, I don't, I don't think that was the case. So remember, and also remember that there's a whole bunch of ladies. There's a whole bunch of ladies from the entire kingdom that is waiting to be the next queen, who is hoping to be the next queen. But Haggai, the, one, the king's eunuch who's in charge of all the women, somehow really, really likes Esther. Hmm. And so she listens to him, and he made sure to promote her. But the, here's the interesting part. The author never gives an explanation as to why Haggai liked Esther so much. But I think God knows the reason. Probably because he has something to do with it. The second, I think it's interesting that people liked her so much because of the, the way Esther found favor in people's eyes. I mean, the author doesn't say she did anything extraordinary. She went along with the customs like everyone else. She didn't go above and beyond. She ate what they ate. She didn't eat anything special. She did what they did. She got the same beauty treatment as all the other girls. She didn't do it for longer or shorter. In other words, she did what everyone else did. But somehow she's special. Somehow. No reason is stated for why Esther's so, so special. I mean, aside from her looks, but I think we all know that looks aren't everything. You can't just look good for someone to like you. But I think God knows the reason. Probably because he has something to do with it. And third, and eventually the author states that the king loved Esther more than all the women. But remember, there's a lot, a lot of beautiful, young, virgin women who are going through this beauty treatment to choose from. Remember, this is arguably the greatest, meaning probably the largest empire in ancient history, but the author writes that the king loved Esther more than anyone else. So despite the fierce competition, against all odds, Esther is chosen to be the next queen instead of Vashti. Coincidence? I think not. Think about it. The author doesn't say she did anything exceptional for the king to like her so much. And even today, I mean, there's a whole lot of beautiful women in this world. And, and even if people, okay, just think with me here. Even, so there's a Miss Universe beauty competition, right? And everyone chooses one Miss Universe to be the most beautiful woman in this universe. But even though she is Miss Universe, I don't think 100% of humanity would agree that she is the most beautiful woman in the world. Because I think we all know that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. There's something beautiful in everyone. 
But somehow the king chose Esther over anyone else in the entire world and no reason is stated? But I think God knows the reason. Again, probably because he had something to do with it. I think it's very clear that Esther and Mordecai played a part in the plan, but it was God who was doing the work. Now, at the same time, I have to remind you that this is only a part of God's ultimate plan. God's ultimate plan was to have a relationship with all his children. That means Jews and Gentiles. Praise God, because otherwise we wouldn't be here today. Before Jesus, there was no way that we could have a direct relationship with God, creator of this universe. The Bible says that we were enemies of God because of our sin, because we rejected him. We didn't want to be in a relationship with him. We were enemies with God. And yet he sends his one and only son, Jesus Christ. That's indisputable that Jesus as a man lived on this earth and he came down as God man so that he could take away the one thing that got in the way with him and us so that we could, that we can have the opportunity to choose to have a relationship with God. And like a loving father, God wants to have a relationship with not just a few or some or even most, but all of his children. And he wants us to participate. Uh, That's that's my uh, second born, uh, Paul. Recently, my son and um, this is one of his friends, they've been been trying to help with some housework. Um, We've been trying to like help with doing the dishes or in my mind, as they want to just play with water. But um, every parent, at, at, when their kids are this age, you understand that uh, them trying to help is not really helping. Like If they're going to do the dishes, then we have to do the dishes again after they're done. And if they're trying to sweep the driveway, which this only lasted like 30 seconds, maybe less, and then I had to take over and finish it up, um, they're not really helping. But we let them help. We let them help as parents. Because we know it brings them such great joy to participate in their parents' work. They want to help their parents. It brings them so much joy. And you know, it actually, we find joy in letting them help as well. We're so proud of them that they would want to participate in what we're doing, that they want to help out in their own way because they want to show that we love you and we want to help you. In the same way, I hope you know that God finds so much joy when we get to participate, that we want to participate in what he's doing. In some, regardless of what, of whether Esther or Mordecai always did the right thing or whether they had the best of motives, God was working through their imperfections to fulfill his perfect plan. Remember, God doesn't need us to be perfect. He doesn't need us to perfectly obey him or he doesn't need us to make perfect decisions. He just wants us to participate. God doesn't need perfect people. God doesn't even need people. And that means he invites us. He wants us to participate. And when we participate, our motives for why we do what we do, they're always going to be corrupted by sin. Sometimes we're not going to even do the right thing. And most times we're going to do things with mixed motives at best. But God still works because God is always at work. And so I want to ask this question because I ask this question at the end of every sermon that I preach. I ask myself this, if I really believe this to be true, how does this change the way that I live? And that's our challenge for us today. Seek to participate in God's plan. Because if I really believe this to be true, that God doesn't need us to fulfill his plan, I think that changes the way that we live. I think if we really believe that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that he could take away our sins so we could be in a relationship with him, I think that really changes something about us. If we really believe this to be true. And honestly, I don't think it really needs to be that big. I don't think we need to all go home, pack our bags, and go be full-time missionaries. I don't think that's what God means here when he says to seek to participate in his plan. I think small or big, it doesn't matter. God just wants us to ask, what are you doing? How can we participate? How can we participate in what you're doing? Because God finds joy in letting us help, 
and we will find great joy in participating in the Father's work. Let's pray.